Why don't more international travellers, Americans, Australians, Canadians, New Zealanders, cruise on British cruise lines? Because you can cruise pretty much anywhere in the world you want to on a British line, with the possible exception of Antarctica. But even more importantly, I realised that I, as a Brit living in Britain, don't cruise on British cruise lines. So I decided to set up a little experiment to work out why. As cruising resumed after shutdown and I could only cruise within the UK, I booked myself on a series of British cruise lines to go and answer the question, what is going on with British cruise lines and why are people like you and me not cruising on them much more? What I found out was really interesting and not at all what I expected. So stick with me and find out why and if you should be cruising on a British cruise line because it's going wherever you want to go. By the way, if you're new here, I'm Gary Bembridge, and my goal is to make it more fun and make it even easier to discover, plan, and enjoy unforgettable cruise vacations. So here I am, in fact, on one of those lines. I'm on P&O Cruises Britannia. Now, the first problem I hit when I started on my experiment and told people I was doing this is everyone pointed out and argued that there's no such thing as an American cruise line and a British cruise line because, in fact, Cruise companies are all registered in tax havens and their ships are registered under flags of convenience. So what I'm going to do in this is I'm going to do what we all know is we actually know there are American lines and there are British lines in practice based on where they kind of their head operations are, where they really focus and who they're really catering for. So on that basis, British cruise lines include things like Cunard, P&O, Saga Cruises, Morella, which is actually part of, Tom, where Thompson's part of TUI Cruises, and there's other lines like Fred Olsen, Majestic, and other smaller lines. US lines or American lines tend to be things, for example, like Carnival, Princess, Holland America, Seabourn, Norwegian, Royal Caribbean, and so on. I think we all pretty much know what they are. There are actually a couple of truly British cruise lines if you go with that purest definition. So Saga, for example, it's registered, all their ships are registered in the UK. Majestic Cruise Line and a few smaller cruise lines. The same as you have lines in Norway, for example, like Viking, Sea Dream, and so on. But anyway, you get my point around what I decided to focus on. However, one of the things that did strike me through that whole process is that British cruise lines have been around so much longer than American cruise lines. You know, Cunard, over 170 years. P&O that I'm on right now, over 180 years. And yet, American lines, which are perhaps 40, 50, or even less years, have completely overtaken those long-established British lines. So does that mean that actually British lines are doing something fundamentally different, something almost wrong? And that's what I decided to explore next. As I explored and thought about a little bit more, of course, what I realized is British cruise lines are very similar to American or even European cruise lines. Let's take a look at a couple of facts. Some of them are even owned by the same corporation. So for example, p Cruises and Cunard Cruises, which are the two biggest UK lines, are actually owned by the Carnival Corporation. So they're even part of the same group. Secondly, many of the ships are exactly the same as ships used by American lines. So take, for example, p and This ship that I'm on right now, Britannia, is exactly the same ship as Royal Class Princess ships. So for example, Regal Princess, which I'm on next, is exactly the same ship. p and Iona, which is their newest ship at the time of recording, is exactly the same ship as Mardi Gras. Arcadia is exactly the same ship as Queen Victoria, Queen Elizabeth, and even things like New Amsterdam in Holland America. So the hardware, the ships, are exactly the same. The crew, like on American ships, are also international. So the bulk of the crew tend to be foreign nationals. So for example, on p and some of the other ships, they have a lot of Indian crew, but you'll still find Filipinos, Indonesians, and so on, as you will find on American cruise lines. As I've already mentioned, the ships tend to be registered in foreign flags of convenience. A couple of key exceptions to that. So for example, Britannia is actually registered in Southampton, which I think was part of the deal having Her Royal Majesty the Queen naming this particular ship. But most of them are then registered in foreign flags of convenience, the same as American cruise lines. So the hardware and a lot of the structure is the same, so it had to be something else. One of the critical things that struck me about British lines versus American lines is British lines are incredibly nationalistic. 
they are incredibly British in everything they do. There's a real structure, there's a real decor, there's a real sentiment around being British. It starts even with the naming of the ship. There's huge energy and pressure put on having members of the royal family, for example, naming cruise ships. So Her Majesty the Queen has named things like the Cunard ships. We've had her name Britannia that I've mentioned. Camilla, the Duchess of Cornwall, has named the Saga Spirit of Discovery. You also find pictures of the royal family around the ships. The sail away parties are very nationalistic. You'll find lots of flag waving, Union Jack flag, flag waving, and singing of things like Rule Britannia. So there's a real sense of national pride on these ships. Artwork is also something that shows that whole national pride. And you'll find there's an enormous amount of artwork by British artists. So for example, on Saga, which I was on just before this as part of my test, they have 1,000 pieces of art. All of those are by artists who live in the UK and 400 pieces were specifically commissioned by artists living in the UK. So the same is true across Britannia and the other ships as well. So again, that strong national link. The onboard currency on most of the lines is the UK pound. There is one key exception, which is Cunard. And as I'll talk about a little bit later, Cunard is interesting because that is probably the most international of all of the lines. That uses the US dollar. You also found on the ships some very specific UK things. So the plugs, for example, you'll find most of the ships will then have the UK three-pronged plugs. You'll find in the cabins there are tea and coffee making facilities with good old English brands like PG Tips. As an interesting aside, when American lines actually sell out of the UK, they will tend to put in tea and coffee making facilities because it's something the British cruiser expects. You'll find lots of British traditions weaved into the ships, so you'll find most of the ships will have a pub selling lots of British beers and ale, and you'll find across the restaurants, you'll always find good British food like bangers and mash, sausages and mash. You'll have good old fry up English breakfast. You'll have steak and kidney pie. You'll have plowman's salad. And of course, you'll have fish and chips will be a staple of the menu. Not surprisingly, partnerships on the ships will also be very much UK names. So in entertainment, you'll find, for example, Pino have partnered with people like Gary Barlow of Take That. Saga have partnered with Jules Holland, a well-known UK entertainer. The toiletries in the cabins will be things like, for example, on here, it's the White Company. That other big English tradition, afternoon tea, is a real staple on every single ship. You'll find there's afternoon tea in the afternoon and it's a really big, you know, extravagant, flamboyant deal. And then, of course, you'll find the entertainment has a UK spin where the songs will be much more UK focused bands, the Beatles, Rolling Stones or Adele or whoever. And of course, all the quizzes will be very UK focused. However, that's probably not something that's likely to put people off. But you'll definitely find there is a huge, strong national British feeling weaved through everything that happens on board the ships. That's not something that I find when I'm on board, say, American lines, you know, your princess, celebrity, whatever. There's not a big, strong sense of uh, American nationalism there. And even on the Norwegian lines like Viking, again, you don't find that sense of patriotism and rah-rah that you will find on British lines. Another key aspect to British cruise lines is dress code. Unlike other countries, whether it's the Norwegian lines, the US lines, UK lines have a much stricter dress code and are much more formal. All of the cruise lines will have formal nights, which will include dinner jacket, tuxedos, glamorous gowns, and they are pretty strictly enforced and people are expected to follow those. Although, of course, you can get away with, say, a suit and tie. But it is a really strict dress code. It's part of British cruising and it's something that's not only expected but required. That's very different around the world where we're seeing a much more relaxation of the dress code and much less formal nights, certainly much less dinner jackets, tuxedos and ball gowns. So I wondered if that was something that perhaps put people off international travellers you know, from coming onto British lines. However, we know that there's a lot of people who are kind of Anglophiles, particularly lots of Americans, you know, they love shows like Downton Abbey. You've got lots of Australians with strong connections to Britain. So is that what's putting them off? There is actually a much bigger reason that more international travellers are not found on British ships. And this was something that really did surprise me enormously. 
Now, as I mentioned, you can cruise on a British cruise line pretty much anywhere in the world. They sail all around the world, whether it's Mediterranean, Alaska, South America, Asia, Japan, Australia. However, one of the key reasons that you don't find more international guests on is that British lines actually make it incredibly difficult, if not in one or two cases, impossible to sell on them unless you are British. Let me give you the most extreme example and then I'll work to the most liberal example. Saga cruises, at this point of time, it is impossible to cruise on Saga unless you have a UK address. So I guess you could be an expat, for example, with a UK address, but you cannot cruise unless you are British, basically. So they are looking at, in the future, perhaps opening it up to other nationalities. So that's the most extreme example. Other lines just make it more difficult. So p and that I'm on right now, for example, they just make it much more challenging to book a p and cruise. And they do tend to focus much more on British residents, but it's not impossible. The most liberal of all, of course, is Cunard, and particularly on Queen Mary II. Now, when I spoke to people on Cunard before, they admitted that their most international ship is actually Queen Mary II. And that's because of its transatlantics, you know, sailing backwards and forwards between Southampton and New York. So it is extremely well known. Once you get onto the other ships, Queen Elizabeth and Queen Victoria, you're much more likely to find it strongly dominated by British travellers, no matter where in the world it is sailing. It is easiest to book on a Cunard, and they do have sales offices all around the world. The other lines just make it so much more difficult. It's almost like they're not wanting to welcome you on board. And what I realised is that what UK lines do is something very different to American or even Norwegian lines like Viking. And what British lines do is they create an island. They create a very safe space, if you like, which then transports British people all around the world in that little bubble. So it's kind of a little cultural bubble and they take you all around the world. And it's interesting because it's kind of like a British mindset in a way, if you think without getting too political, but you know, in the old colonial days, it was about exporting the British way all around the world. But it's very interesting that British cruise lines do really create this little bubble, very safe space, very, very British, and take it all around the world. So for example, when they go to the Caribbean, they will charter flights and fly people into the Caribbean and then sell people around the Caribbean and fly them back to the UK rather than actively go out and sell those cruises to international travellers. So if you're looking to experience a truly British experience, it is possible, but you have to be a little bit determined. Cunard is your easiest way in, Pino probably the next, and at the moment, Saga, not so. And it's definitely something worth trying. So particularly if you have a strong affinity for British culture and British people and British traditions, definitely consider looking at a British cruise line if it's doing an itinerary that you like, whether it's Alaska, for example, Japan, Australia, or even the Mediterranean, because you will get truly immersed in the British culture. And of course, you'll get to meet a lot of British people. Now, if you want to know more about some of those British lines, I've put together a short playlist with some of the overviews of the very specific British lines. So why don't you take a look at those right now? I'm starting, of course, with Cunard. And one of the most important things you need to know about cruising with Cunard. So, Take a click on that and I'll see you over there.